Good afternoon, I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media. Welcome to our webinar on South Africa's transport sector, where our distinguished panel of speakers will discuss how upgrading transport infrastructure can improve economic growth. Our webinar today is sponsored by Astron Energy, BDO South Africa, MTN and Investec. We thank them for their support in making this event possible. Before we start, please note that we've activated the Q&A function for your questions. Please direct any questions to the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. While we may not get to every question during the hour together, rest assured we will review each one. Additionally, the chat feature is enabled for your comments and insights. Look for it right next to the Q&A box. Remember though, questions should go into the Q&A to ensure that they are properly addressed in that section. Please be informed that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available to you afterwards. Also, we're broadcasting live on YouTube and the link will be shared in the chat once it becomes accessible. Thanks so much for your attention. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Alvin Harris, the president of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport South Africa. Alvin is an expert in freight rail, having worked for 15 years at Transnet and 13 and a half years in national government across the departments of transport, trade and industry, and public enterprises. He was also a board member of the Railroad Association of South Africa, holding several roles. Elvin will facilitate the discussion with our panel members who include Rudy Dix, head of the project management office in the private office of the president, Siabonga Mtembo, audit partner at BDO South Africa, Jamie Holly, the CEO of Traction and the chairperson of the Africa Railway Industry Association. Kulekane Mate, the deputy CEO of Business Unity South Africa, or BUSA. Ian Bird, senior executive for the Transport and Logistics Focal Area of Business for South Africa, or B4SA. And Dr. Andrew Shaw, chief strategy and planning officer at Transnet SOC. And without further ado, I'll hand over now to our facilitator to take the proceedings forward. Over to you, Elvin. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Shannon. Uh, thank you and welcome to everybody to this uh, awesome webinar. Uh, and also thank you very much to our uh, esteemed panelists for joining us uh, in this very critical conversation that we need to have about our transport and logistics sector. Uh, I'm sure everybody that has joined and those that will still continue to join um, uh, recognizes the, the, the critical importance of these conversations and for us to basically get uh, onto the same page as it were in terms of where we are and where we are going. Uh, I think it's not lost on any one of us here how important it is that our transport system uh, gets sorted out. And uh, in the light of that, we have really assembled, I think, a fantastic team uh, from various different, very important components of our economy and government uh, that we can engage with today. Uh, an hour goes by fast, uh, I must say. And so uh, we will try and keep the questions uh, pointed and sharp. And also uh, we hope that um, our panelists will also give us uh, short and sharp responses. Um, uh, as Shannon had indicated, please place your questions in the Q&A section uh, and raise your comments in the chat. Um, we've got a lot to get through, so let me start with uh, our esteemed gentleman from the presidency, Mr. Rudy Dix. Uh, perhaps if we can start with you, sir, to give us a bit of an overview at the macro level, uh, some of the work that's been going on, some of the deep thinking that's been happening at presidency level, uh, the questions that, that you are grappling with. Could you maybe just start to share with us uh, what is your understanding and that at the presidency of the main factors that's uh, been, you know, kind of hampering the performance of our of our logistics system the past few years? Thank, thanks, Alvin. M maybe just contextualize it quickly before we get to that. And, and I su suppose many here uh, would talk about that. Um, that are quite familiar, but uh, as you probably are familiar with, I mean, in the in the sixth administration, the president um, and this is post COVID response, the president uh, felt it necessary to uh, launch a structural reform program to get our, our economy back on track, and that that was the important part because, of course, 
uh, economic growth, inclusive growth, employment creation, investment has been a huge, huge factor in hampering our ability to develop as a country. And part of that was located in the economic reconstruction and recovery plan. But the structural reform program has been quite an important part of that, uh, and quite significantly so. And that structural reform program uh, is under operation for Nidlela. And um, one of those things were that they targeted four key um, network sectors, five key, four key network sectors and one reform area related to visas. But we said that what is in our control and what is it that we can do to be able to stimulate great investment by the private sector and create an environment for the private sector to invest in sectors that have traditionally been dominated by the state-owned enterprise sector, but allow for competition where we've taken policy decisions many years back have not been implemented. So that reform was about energy reforms, was about logistics, and this is the debate here, water reforms, for example, um, telecommunication reforms, um, and then, of course, visa reforms. So in that context, I think it was aptly, you know, um, 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 co conceptualized to be able to drive that, that reform. And of course, this, this is a partnership that is initiated by the presidency and the national treasury. Um, in doing the reform program, I, I think what then happened was the a confluence of different factors where we suddenly saw an a significant increase in challenges around energy supply. So we needed to deal with the reform and the ability for us to be able to have stable security. But what it did do was, you know, perfect storm, if one would say, um, and, you know, ability to be able to talk about just transition, the ability to, energy, to be energy secure, and the ability to reform the market space in energy. And similarly in logistics, we find ourselves in a very similar situation where you, you say set a reform program where ultimately what you wanted was significantly to try and deal with um, the inefficiency, inefficiencies in the logistics system by separating um, infrastructure and, and, uh, and uh, operations and creating greater competition. But at the same time, like in, in, in ESCOM, you, you'd found a, a significant decline in the operational efficiencies through a whole set of different factors. There's no one factor, right? Uh, that have all contributed to this. So again, a confluence of that, a perfect storm for us to be able to deal with reforms that are quite critical to take out uh, our logistics sector and, and transit in particular to a different level and, and improve its operational environment, but at the same time, introduce uh, introduce competition. So what we have done is form, for example, a national, national logistics crisis committee that deals with all of these factors from security to operational performance to procurement, uh, to crisis on the roads, for example, uh, to issues relating to the reform program, and has been critical and central in trying to address and support the transit management. It's not intended to take over transit management, to support transit management in dealing with operational weaknesses and performance, as well as doing the reform and dealing with a number of factors. So uh, other factors, critical factors to change around. So this has been an ongoing uh, intervention supported by government, led by the presidency, led by DOT and Transnet, um, and and um, you know um, it's been I mean it's been an, a, a difficult, of course, a difficult ride, but I think there is lots of light at the end of the tunnel. We're beginning to see some green shoots. We're beginning to see some of the reform stuff coming through. So I, I think just from a macro level, that's an important context as to where we sit and what we need to do to support the operational performance of Transnet and eventually improve the logistics sector overly in improving great efficiency in the economy and to get better growth. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Rudy. Within that, um, and understanding, you know, coming from the last 10 odd years plus, um, and some of the solutions through uh, Operation Volindlela, through the National Logistics Crisis Committee, the reform agenda being uh, driven now. Um, what is the sense that what are the biggest priority areas that needs to be tackled? Sure, uh, the, the Transnet um, performance e is a critical one. Uh, is it a case of uh, slowdown of investment, lack of investment over time, is, is it ability uh, on the funding side and financing the relevant uh, infrastructure? Is it uh, a question of do we have the right kind of technologies uh, in our system to 
uh, to work with whatever infrastructure is there and increase the levels of performance? Uh, is it maybe a management issue? Um, what did you say are, are maybe the, the two top priority areas that we really need to grapple with? And, and you oh, know, once this... that is done, then we the others can follow on from there. Armand, to be honest, I think it's uh, it's all those factors. I think it's not one that is there. Uh, and I think if one says the biggest the biggest factor is the uh, our inability, and we've got to take all responsibility, our inability to invest in maintenance and the backlog in infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that has now come home to roost. Very similar to anything else. If you don't manage your assets in an adequate way, if you don't do investment. But what caused mm -hmm. that? That's the most important part, and that's the question that one has to ask. And that may be a whole set of different things in relation to whether there's financing available. What many people don't talk about is the fact that state capture has been central in causing that, because it meant that resources were diverted as part of the state capture project away from resources that was meant, for example, on maintenance and, and, uh, and uh, services of cranes, for example, on the ports, right? or purviews or, or um, you know, e signaling systems or any part of the network that requires to be, that to be required to be maintained. What we've got to realize is a whole set of different things, including the issue around locals, for instance. So I'm saying all of those factors are quite important and we've got to address them. We, 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 can't, we can't do one part and say, and, and, I, and, I, and I do say this all the time. So it's not that we've got to deal with operational performance only and then put aside the reform program. The solution to be able to ensure that we get that volumes up and we get transept operating is also part of the solution of involving the private sector in commercial um, opportunities and opening up the network. So those are going to be important things. Part of that is at the same time dealing with the operational issues and we've got to look at it from a corridor point of view. We've got to look at it from put to port. We've got to make a whole set of different decisions. And then we've got to take decisions around open access, for example, and uh, getting the network statement out, third party access, mm -hmm. access charges, for example, as well as private sector participation on some of the, you know, on some of the parts of the network or in the port space, for instance. So I think it's quite important for us to understand that. But I think the biggest constraint right now is the is the state of the infrastructure. And, and we've got to take a lot of measures to be able to um, uh, deal with that. Uh, of course, if you talk about private sector participation, you've got, to, you've got to understand who's going to pay for the cost of that and who's responsible for that. And you can't expect to ask the private sector to pay for something that they didn't wear and take, right? So these are complex things. But if there's one thing that I say that is going to be the critical one is to be able to deal with the ability to um, um, to uh, to um, address the, the the backlog on the infrastructure and the maintenance that's going forward, and hopefully we don't sit and find ourselves in such a situation again. I'm I'm sure we'll hear a little bit just now from some of the colleagues on uh, on the panel on on how the private sector views some of this. So I think it's it's an important point that you do mention there that. Um, uh, we need private sector to be involved in this uh, uh, resuscitation and revitalization, but at the same time, finding the balancing act was not oversettling the private sector with issues that government uh, needed to have dealt with and maybe still need to deal with now. Just very briefly, uh, in terms of the uh, lessons learned uh, from uh, the work done on Operation Volintlela, both the the analysis and, and strategizing work, as well as some of the implementation uh, across the various uh, different pillars of Volint Lela. What are some of the lessons, uh, Rudy, that you hope uh, uh, can be brought in from those learnings into uh, helping us to probably to possibly accelerate uh, implementation uh, now in the, in the transport and logistics uh, system? Oh, well, the main thing is that we've got to work together, right, and solve this. So we've got to work with the private sector. We've got to work across gov different government departments. We've got to work with research, skilled experts. We've got to bring the international teams in. We've got to work with them. And that's the mm -hmm. important part of the successes of Operation Wooden Leather. That it's nothing, there, there's, no, there's no red lines and saying we're not going to involve the private sector. We brought them in. And that's the, that's the important part. Uh, Michael Barber talks about the alchemy of relationships. The alchemy, of, uh, the alchemy of relationships is central to a delivery methodology that talks about how we can track 
and ensure there's high levels of accountability. That's the second point, transparency and accountability. We've got to talk about okay. these difficult things in the public domain. We've got to say, as we did during the energy crisis, look, we're going to go into stage six, but you know, in a year's time, in 18 months' time, in six months' time, this is what we think the outlook's going to be. I mean, the most important part is that you've got to have a clear roadmap. You've got to show that there are milestones. More importantly, you've got to meet those milestones. And you've got to hold feet to fire and ensure that, that that does happen. And then, of course, I think the leadership issues are going to be quite critical. So you've got the right set of skills. You've got the right people in the right positions. And that's going to be critical as well. So lots of lessons learned. But the more important part is being able to weave together a, a strategy and an intervention that takes into account everybody in the space that we can solve our problems nationally and eventually get the kind of economic growth that we want. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to come back to you a little bit later if you can just ponder a bit. Um, I think I'd like to just get your view and from from presidency side, uh, we have seen some reports coming out from the World Bank about the performance of uh, the South African ports. And maybe we can just come back to that. And then as we roll out now the reform agenda in terms of third party access on the rail network in particular, perhaps pushing some more uh, PSPs on the port side and elsewhere in the transport system. Um, has there been a, 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 an, an identification, a clear understanding, especially when it comes to third party access uh, from international experience? What are some of the critical success factors that makes implementation work? Uh, I think we've seen uh, a number of other opportunities be put to market um, uh, before by Transnet. Um, um, the slots on the, on the container corridor that went out a couple of years ago, they didn't go too well. Uh, some of the discussions now around the network statement and what is good about it and what is what is really challenging for the private sector to come on board. And so just to think about that, we'll come back later to you, just the kind of things that we know or believe of from under understanding what, what are the things that might make them work. And do we have all of that in place or at least a large chunk of that in place so that as we embark and we get out of the station, that really we're going to run and the train is really going to pick up speed instead of, you know, slowing down and being forced to halt, as with the case now, for instance, also with the XT and the APMT uh, uh, issues at the port side. How do we prevent those from, from happening? Uh, do we have enough ducks in, in the road? So, um, uh, but but I will, I will come back to you uh, on that one just now. Uh, if I can just switch over uh, maybe to uh, Sia Bonga, uh, and I would stay a little bit on the macro side of things for the moment, and then we'll dive into, into the micro issues. Um, so um, if I can just perhaps uh, get a view, Sia Bonga, from you. Um, um, you know, of course, um, Energy is important, technology, IT, communications technologies, uh, water, all kinds of infrastructure uh, is important. Uh, what are the kinds of things, you know, that you feel is important from the transport and, and logistics uh, sector that, that is quite important for economic performance of the country? All right, thanks, thanks, Rudy. I, I think maybe before I, I respond to your question, I just want to um, echo what um, um, uh, sorry, Rudy was saying. Sorry, Elvin, I called you Rudy. Well, what Elvin was saying uh, with, with regards to uh, yeah, with regards to the importance of uh, um, uh, private public partnership, um, I, I think it is critical and it is important. I mean, I, I operate in the um, in the audit space, um, I do audit a few consortiums where we've seen a group of mining companies coming together, uh, obviously wanting to partner with Transnet as an example, uh, to assist in fixing issues uh, pertaining to the railway line. Specifically, I, th I think mine, mining companies that are based in the Northern Cape. I think the same uh, is, is happening in the, in the automotive industry. I'm actually based in the Nelson Mandela Bay. Uh, so we've seen uh, some of the OEMs um, in, in, in the Eastern Cape as well as in uh, 
uh, in the Gauteng area coming together to basically form these consortiums to say, look, uh, as 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 private business, we want to uh, we want to partner with with the government to basically be part of the solution. So I just wanted just to echo that. Um, so I, I just want to also um, maybe Elvin just take a, a, a step back. I mean, obviously, when we, we normally debate and talk about these issues, that I think the focus is usually on your transnet is usually on the on on, on the ports and all of that. Um, but but the reality is that um, the economy of of this country is heavily reliant on on the labor force. I think that's the part that we normally neglect. And and what I mean about that is. Uh, you, you here you're talking about majority of your labor force that has to at the minimum take two taxes to to basically get to work, which majority is still uh, located in the townships and all of that. And, and what um, we've started seeing, and I'm sure you've also noticed that, is that there's been these informal settlements that are basically popping up literally everywhere. Um, and, and the reason for that is 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 people want to be want to be closer to 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 the places where, where they work uh to basically reduce the amount of hours that they spend on the road to try and get to the workplace and also uh not to find themselves in um obviously in a situation there where 50 percent or more than 50 percent of their salaries or wages goes towards um paying for transport and all of that so i just wanted to touch on that a bit um i i think then obviously the impact of, of that is, is even though sometimes it is neglected is the fact that um government is now having to redirect uh, uh huge sums of funds and i think rudy touched on it as well huge sums of funds that could be used to to stimulate the economy uh, and that could be used basically just to to fix um the infrastructure pertaining to transport and logistics whereby these funds are redirected to um, either fighting crime that is coming from these informal settlement uh fixing the infrastructure that was never designed in the first place to uh to handle such volumes so i I think we also just need to then look at the in, indirect impact that all of this is is is, is causing, um, and and then obviously then coming to the issue um, of uh, that we've been touching on of, uh, of of the port of Transnet and and everything else, um, like I said earlier on, I'm based in Nelson Mandela Bay. Uh, we've recently had an issue where um, it's I think it's the Liquid Fuels Wholesalers Association. I went to the minister. Um, to basically uh, make a request that the Nelson Mandela Bay region be rezoned as inland, uh, basically meaning that we did not get the benefits of the fuel reduction uh, like everybody else uh, that's based in the coastal areas. And that's simply because of the fact that in the ports in East London, the fuel bed got damaged and then uh, the wholesalers obviously then had, had to uh, transport fuel via trucks from uh, East London to Port uh, to the Nelson Mandela Bay, so those are, are all of the things that we need to be mindful of and look at and 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 have an understanding in terms of the negative impact then it has um, on our economy specifically when you look at um, the issues around um, around transport and, log and logistics. Um, I mean we've we've touched on earlier. Uh, I've been I've I've spoken about the issues around mine, the impact that it has on the mining. Uh, companies as well as uh, the auto industry spe specifically if uh, you look at the at the north to south corridor which is uh, currently under discussion okay thanks uh, thanks yeah bonga for that um if i maybe jamie can just switch over to you for a second uh i think um, Rudy did paint that picture as well um on what the plans are how does Traction uh, assess the current situation in terms of South Africa's rail infrastructure? And and perhaps uh, what is on the table at the moment for the plans for improving it? Well, then, thanks. Look, I think, you know, you, the way that we think about the South African rail infrastructure, infrastructure is we kind of think about the rail industry in, in two parts. Uh, we think about the general freight business, and then we think of the bulk, the bulk business. Okay, and, and um, you know, the sort of broad scale numbers there are that about two thirds of the volumes moved in the South African rail network are bulk, and about one third is is um, is general freight. Okay, and however, um, and depending on how you define what what lines are bulk lines, the bulk yeah. lines are somewhere between seven and fifteen percent of the total network. So you've got two thirds of total volumes moving on between seven and fifteen percent of the total network. Okay, so. Um, the, and, you know, we spent about the last three and a half years developing business cases um, for investment when, um, when the, the, the rail reform um, journey is ready for us. Um, 
And um, at the moment, the only business cases that we can see make sense are over bulk freight. Okay, so so new investment into trains do not make sense on a general freight from a general freight perspective. And the reason for that is exactly as Rudy says, about 12 years ago, Transnet started spending about one third of the amount that they were spending previously on maintenance. Okay, and and over the last 12 year period, you've now got an accumulated backlog of maintenance expenditure in excess of 34 billion Rand. And of course you can't spend, if you don't spend 10 Rand 12 years ago, you can't expect to spend 10 Rand today. That number increases exponentially. So you've got a situation now where the, you know, the, that um, the, the Rail Association area believes that the network needs a minimum of 150 billion Rand and probably about 220 billion Rand in order to bring the network back to its design condition, okay? So effectively what that means is that as you seek to solve the two problems for South Africa's rail industry and, and rail transportation, which is too little freight moving on the tracks, in other words, not enough trains, and then the condition of the infrastructure, you're gonna see investment, I believe, into the bulk sectors in South Africa to start with, okay? But in order to unlock investments into general freight, you need the trains to turn around quickly. And for the trains to turn around quickly, you need to have high quality infrastructure. To have high quality infrastructure, we're going to need to see this rollout of, I believe, circa 200 billion Rand into the infrastructure. Okay. Now, you know, to government's uh, significant credit, there's two policies here and there's two directions as to how we solve this problem. On the one hand, we've got third party access, which addresses the first problem of not enough trains by tapping the private sector to bring train capacity to the network. And then the other side, you've got the PSP project with the, the PSP framework having been approved, the PSP unit outside of Transnet sitting in the DOT, I believe going to the department, to DBSA, who's going to design the projects for the private sector to invest into the condition of the infrastructure, to uplift the condition of the infrastructure, to make it feasible to invest into trains. Okay. And this is where an enormous opportunity presents itself for Transnet and for the country, because you know, if you consider the NAFCO line, the Durban, the, the, or the container corridor of the Durban Line, 710 kilometers in each direction, okay? Signaling solution designed in the 70s, implemented in the 80s, designed transit time of 18 hours, okay? And that's if a signaling solution that is now circa 50 years old, okay? Mm. If we go with a modern signaling solution for that line, we don't upgrade the line to a high speed line, 120 kilometers in the straight, 60 kilometers an hour around the curves. You can get from a transit time that's designed at 18 hours down to nine hours, 52 minutes by our initial modeling, okay? Now, if transit at present, depending on who you talk to, is, is using about three days on the transit from Jovi to Durban, that means three days on the transit means a best case scenario, you're invoicing each train 10 times in a month, okay? Now, imagine a scenario where you're running a train in nine hours and 52 minutes. It means you're theoretically invoicing a train twice in a day, 60 times in a month, the same train set can generate you six times the revenue. Sure. Theoretically, all my practically life doesn't happen that way in us and railway. Certainly not that it doesn't happen that way. But this is the massive opportunity that both sides present. It's the investment into the infrastructure, as Rudy said, that is the primary challenge that the country has, but also a wonderful opportunity for the upliftment of the competitiveness of the upstream economy, which is the most important. Thanks, uh, thanks for that, Jamie. I think some interesting numbers there that you uh, that you uh, have put on the table. Um, uh, okay, yes, operational performance. It's always great if the system performs uh, according to the design, uh, but uh, that that does become a challenge. Um, uh, but certainly, it can be a lot better than it is. Uh, Doctor Shaw, if I can uh, just maybe come to you in terms of uh, the required investment that Jamie was just speaking about. I think some of the numbers that's publicly available is somewhere between 50 to 70 billion rand. Perhaps that's a number that I've seen that speaks about what uh, needs to be put into the rail system to upgrade it to sufficient uh, standards, deal with the backlogs. Uh, I think Jamie mentioned the number of bit somewhere, well, double to almost triple that amount, uh, 150 to 220. Um, if you perhaps could just give us a view just on the, 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 the quantum of the numbers, um, uh, Andrew, which is which is a bit uh, closer to uh, what we what the system does require. Um, Elvin, yeah, good to see you again. Um, 
Um, I think Jamie is fairly closely correct. So our minimum number over five years is 34, 34 billion required in the network. But we're very clear that actually that is by far just a very uh, low end um, investment. That's just to deal with uh, infrastructure that in fact will fall over um, if, if we didn't invest in it. We've put a number of around 50 billion uh, forward, which includes some upgrade in signaling now. Signaling is really critical. Um, the, the SA signaling system is in the region of about 30 to 40 years old. And if you have multiple operators on the system, uh, signaling becomes really important because you tra you're selling train slots. So um, you have to operate a, sh a scheduled railway, which we've not done for, for quite a considerable period of time. We also have an outlier number of around 70 billion, uh, again, over a five-year period now. Um, the 70 billion number is also on the basis of a reduced economic network. Um, and maybe that's an area, uh, Jamie, that's important to just be clear about is that it's very clear that we've tried to sustain a, a, a network of infrastructure that's that's way too big for what we need. You know, in in years gone by, we invested in, in railways to every farm, every plot. M much of that we actually are now um, going to pass over to DOT or engage with them around a branch line strategy to 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 allow the private to take up what they can. In other instances, we actively will sell the the scrap in some of those that there's just no economic or developmental use for for that. So, um, getting the number right is also means looking at what is the economic network. I just want to raise one other point about the spending, Alvin, which I think you well know, and that is that the degree of vandalism on the network is very sure. very. Um, substantial and that that has a big impact on what the ultimate number is so last year last financial year we we lost over a thousand kilometers of 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 copper cable um now that's roughly from Harting to east london um disappear in a year and that's copper you everyone knows what the price of copper is which we have to replace uh, we do try and replace it with alternative materials we're not always able to do that we've got to bring the cost of that into the equation as well as just the cost of losing infrastructure uh, to vandalism um, that um, that is not actually part of just network degradation. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Alvin. Uh, thanks, uh, Andrew. I think indeed, I think it's good to know that uh, the number that Transnet has is 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 just to deal with the the, the most essential uh, uh, maintenance backlogs, uh, and that there is some alignment in terms of the overall numbers required. Um, in terms of what's happening at the ports in the moment, at the moment, we know there's been some significant challenges the last few months at the ports. Andrew, if perhaps you could just share with uh, with the audience, what is Transnet doing about uh, really fundamentally improving uh, the performance at the ports? Okay, so um, I'm going to start by just saying, um, in our recovery plan, we have a target on, on, on the rail side, which is 170 million tons in year around. 5% short on that. Um, so the rail side, we're progressing and pushing that quite hard. I think um, industry would like us to be pushing that harder. On the port side, um, in terms of port performance, and we measure port performance in terms of equipment availability, um, in terms of uh, crane moves per hour, in terms of ship turnaround. So we use a whole series of measures, which actually collectively also form part of the World Bank measure that you mentioned previously. Mm -hmm. Um, we're, we're not doing as well against those measures as we would like. Um, the biggest contributor to that is, is um, the quality of equipment, um, port equipment, and a, a number of um, new um, port equipment uh, from cranes to straddle carriers, et cetera, et cetera, right across the system is now in order. We have received tugs, which has helped us with the ship turnaround problem. But at this point, we're still reliant on very much outdated and, and frankly, just unreliable equipment in the port. So we do hope to, to improve on, on that. But I can say that we are not quite on target, thanks. And then just before we leave the ports uh, for the moment, Andrew, can you also just then share with us in terms of the recent uh, uh, KwaZulu Natal High Court judgment on uh, the halt of the um, transaction with XT? Um, for the operation of DCT2. Um, how, is, how is Transnet intending to deal with that and how soon hopefully can we get a resolution and, and Transnet gets a, a private sector player on board? Yeah, it's, a disappoint, it's disappointing. Um, just from the standpoint, not in terms of who selected, I don't think we have any particular um, uh, player in, in mind around the selection. What we just want to do is 
is allow the transaction to happen so we can get the benefits of the transaction. Um, and so the delay through the court system is really quite challenging for, for Transnet. Um, maybe, El Elvin, just to say, you know, the judgment was handed down um, earlier this month, so it's fairly new. Mm -hmm. It's an interim interdict, so it doesn't set aside the awarding of DCT to, to ICTSI, which is the, the bidder that we had been engaged with. Um, that's, that process actually comes through a second hearing, which is called yes. Part B of the hearing. We're not sure when that may be heard. We are hoping that it will be heard fairly soon next year. Um, and that obviously from that we can we can take a, a view. But whatever we do, we will abide by um, by the court and, and its finding. You know, we were very clear about that. Um, ultimately, we would just like to get the ma matter concluded as quickly as possible, get in somebody who can definitely provide us with the performance and investment that we require and get the DCT2 terminal to be, you know, world class. That's, that's really our objective. Um, as fast as we possibly can do it and align to the court judgment. That's that's really just our principles. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. And yes, thank you also for correcting me that it's not the judgment that's setting aside the the, the decision. Uh, it was just an interim to, to halt and then part B will deal with the bigger issues. Um, Mr. Martha, if I can come to Business Unity South Africa, um, I think it's great uh, that this partnership between government and business uh, is now being transferred to the logistics sector. We've seen it working well in the energy sector. In a sense, it's a, it's a second phase of the partnership. Um, uh, so, uh, and that it, uh, it's being renewed now also with the government of national unity, the, the spirit is good. Uh, what role do, you know, from a BUSA point of view, um, uh, do you believe that the transport sector needs to play in order to get the economy to grow, you know, three, four percent levels? Uh, and of course, that is what instills confidence uh, to the private sector, to the business community that enables them to invest more, employ more you know, and, and therefore improve uh, uh, lives for, for all uh, in the country. Thanks, uh, Alvin, and uh, uh, good afternoon to everybody who is attending this um, webinar. I am surprised, Alvin, that we left the port so quickly. That is certainly not the experience of the vessels that go into our ports. They don't leave as quickly as you did. But hopefully uh, <laughs> we will be able to get uh, get to that. Um, firstly, I think, uh, Alvin, that we, I certainly believe that we live in interesting times in South Africa uh, because, uh, not because of the, the, the setbacks, economic setbacks that we have suffered as a consequence of the underperformance of our logistics systems, but because we can have these conversations, right? Conversations about how to revitalize our logistics system. And these are conversations we couldn't have, um, you know, in the past because I think we were ideologically invested in the idea of a monopoly running and dominating our logistics system. We are now in a position where we're looking at drawing in all different players to come and help um, revitalize, modernize, and create greater efficiencies in our system. And certainly from the point of view of the partnership with, with, with government, we are excited about the prospects of um, uh, 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 the private sector playing a role in, in, in this particular sector. It's, it's worth stating that um, our growth ambitions as a country depend hugely on us sorting out the, the logistics crisis that we face. In the same way, perhaps the same measure that our current underperformance has been impacted by the logistics uh, sector as an economy. So, so, so it is absolutely critical that we unlock the potential of this economy uh, through addressing the logistics challenges and, and, and accessing and expanding trade opportunities and growing at much higher levels. Our sense is that 
This economy can grow at 3.3% by 2025 or, uh, you know, or thereabout. But that's not a target. This is simply saying that if we take the right decisions, make the right investments, it is possible to get to that level. And I think that should galvanize all of us to put our energy and focusing on the right things. And let me make just one point before I, I, I stop, Elvin, and that is that part of what Rudy said at the beginning, which I agree with, is that uh, we've had a confluence of factors, uh, including state capture, complicating matters, etc. And in a sense, it's because we do not let the evidence lead us in terms of the de de decisions that we make. In the past, we allow uh, all manner of other considerations to come into the mix, thus leading into wrong decisions being made uh, in the manner that we've seen. So, you know, in your panel, you have Dr. Andrew Shaw, who is uh, the author of the most seminal piece of work called Moving South Africa, which, by the way, should have been revised. We should be perhaps now on version three or four of that work, continuing to guide what we do in this sector. It was not done because we just do not value evidence and credible evidence enough. I had the privilege of working in the National Planning Commission. We wrote the beautiful piece of work called the National Development Plan. How much of it has been achieved six years into our target period? Very little. And again, it's because we think that we can ignore things and still achieve um, the goals that we want to achieve. We have got to be very focused and take the right decisions. Logistics run on infrastructure. You know, you can't look away and hope that things will continue to run if you don't address your infrastructure challenges, if you don't invest in maintenance and all of that. It simply gets worse and getting us to the point that where we are. So very excited about the opportunity for the private sector to get involved. Very excited about the fact that we're actually having these conversations and looking at uh, uh, lifting our country out of this, but we've got to remain focused. We can't allow a situation where, um, say, when President Ramaphosa leaves, somebody else comes and then we and, and then something else, uh, the focus shifts to something else. As a country, we've got to hold people accountable because we will get into much worse positions if we allow that. So we've got to stay the course. We now have uh, the roadmap, freight logistics roadmap. We just have to make sure that we implement that that that, that uh, document to the T because it will help us address some of these challenges. We can't allow a situation where some other funny document comes up and some other strategy comes up and, and shifts our focus away. Thanks, Alvin. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Kulikani. Much appreciated. I just want to check with you. Um, I think, Jamie, uh, if I heard you correctly, sir, you seem to have suggested that, uh, uh, you know, at least from a traction point of view and perhaps other uh, potential train operators being in the shoes of a, of a train operator get, getting access onto the network, I thought I heard you lean towards uh, government. Here is the... the, the a gap to fix the infrastructure, including the signaling, as Andrew had uh, emphasized as well. Uh, can you take care of that uh, and then you bring us onto the system so that we can operate efficiently? Uh, is there a sense also then that how do how does the P, how does the private sector be uh, get brought on board so that there is also scope for the private sector to assist uh, effectively in 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 funding uh, some of that infrastructure so if i see you shaking your head i want to test with uh, with kulikani is the appetite from the private sector that that investment uh, that partnership that business wants to play with government uh, that the roles where you see your, uh, as a private sector playing is both on the infrastructure side as well as the rolling stock side Thanks again, Elvin. Um, I mean, as I, so how we've characterized the work that we've been doing with government is that uh, both in the case of ESCOM and in the case of the transport and logistics, there's been an urgent need to fix, have to stem the decline uh, in, in, the, in, in these network services. And so as business, we came in 
boots and all, to work alongside our government colleagues in France and everywhere, just to make sure that we stem the decline. Um, but what we'll see us through in the long term is really to have the right framework that ensure private investment on commercially sound terms, right? And so that's not yet in place, but that's being developed as, as it was indicated by both Rudy and, uh, and, 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 and Andrew in terms of having the PSP framework in place and building the, 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 the necessary um, regulatory uh, capabilities to make sure that we do that. So absolutely, when the terms arrive, the private sector will definitely come on board and, and be part of the solution. But as I said, on commercially sound terms. Thank you. Thank you, Kulikani. Andrew, there was just a question that came to you. Let me pose it quick. I think you can dispense of it perhaps quickly uh, from the, from the Q&A. Um, with all the vandalism that's going on, and I think there's somebody that's posted on the chat as well uh, about the vandalism issues. Um, um, how difficult is it to switch the uh, the the fleet, the the locomotive fleet, from uh, mainly electric to mainly diesel or all diesel? And uh, and be, just be done away with the table theft issues once and for all. Uh, thanks very much, Alvin. I guess you'd probably be better placed than me to answer this question, but given that you posed it to me. Um, look, uh, that, that, that question came from uh, uh, Andrew Pike. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> for, for those of you who knows the Transcend Network, it's it's got a distinct set of, of locomotive types allocated to different parts of the network, and depending on whether it's bulk or, um, or general freight. <clears throat> so there are parts of the network that are majority operated with by diesel, so Ferrogram, Magnetite in Limpopo, Pumalanga, and then the GFP network, the NATCO or container corridor that, John, uh, that Jamie mentioned. But the big bulk corridors are all electrified. So, you know, um, it's very difficult if you get vandalism in those areas to do anything about it because the traction requirement is such that you have to use these big heavy haul uh, electric locomotives. Um, you don't really have a choice. It is possible to um, bring some diesel into that, you know, just a, more like an, a, as an emergency or as a, as a quick fix, but it's not, a, it's not really a, a long-term long -term solution. So for those big bulk corridors, we pretty much have the most efficient uh, traction equipment, which is which is electric. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Mr. Bird, last but not least, my dear, my dear friend Ian, um, you. you you've you've been uh, also uh, um, quite involved uh, heavily the last couple of years uh, with the National Logistics uh, Crisis Committee, uh, a, a key part of. Um, um, the building of the relationships and um, defining of the processes and and the, the plans uh, coming out of uh, that space. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what would you say are some of the the, the milestones that uh, both government and business can be happy about in terms of uh, what the partnership has achieved the last few years? Good. Thank you, Elvin, and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, We've been very fortunate in, in dealing with the NLCC, the National Logistics Crisis Committee. We come from deep learnings out of the business and government partnership um, that was first uh, started around the, the COVID challenges. So there's two or three years of learnings there. And I think the, the partnership there was internationally recognized in, in the COVID rollout. That, then, that model was then carried forward into the National Energy Crisis Committee, NECOM, uh, again, uh, as Rudy had indicated earlier, under Operation Bull and Leila. So we then came basically as the third um, the third uh, event, if you will, in, in terms of this, this partnership. But more critically, um, it's allowed us those learnings. And albeit we've only been going really since September of last year with the NLCC, um, NECOM has been going longer, so there's been learnings. And then we've also added, as we indicated, the crime and, and corruption work stream. So there's three focal areas in this partnership, and each one of them have uh, got milestone to date. And particularly, as one can see, with the with energy having started earlier than NECOM, we are now uh, enjoying the, the fruits of, of those efforts. In terms of the NLCC particularly, um, we've had phase one, if you will, now that, as I said, basically September last year, which really came about with a change of management 
in Transnet, and um, we we were we were really brought forward as the NLC, well as business uh, engaging with the NLCC to to work closer uh, with Transnet. The milestones to date, um, I think critically, we've established uh, corridor recovery teams on the five main corridors. That's coal, chrome, um, manganese, chrome and magnetite, manganese, iron ore, and containers. And those these corridor recovery teams meet regularly, um, in most cases uh, twice a month, with the executive managing the uh, freight rail, uh, the port terminals, TNPA and transit engineering, so a full suite of the services um, on those corridors and business and the National Logistics Crisis Committee uh, members attend those corridor recovery teams. We have standard agendas, standard report backs and, and some robust discussions in those corridor recovery mm -hmm. teams. And that allows us to, to look forward. Um, we've added um, seconded resources from the private sector into the offices of TPT and T, um, TFR. Um, and, and that's been really helpful with support uh, from, from business uh, funding. Uh, critically, we've also, um, through the Richards Bay Coal Terminal, developed a mutual cooperation agreement, which allows um, urgent spares and resources to be procured um, and, and those put into the service. Um, and then there's a clawback mechanism for, for Richards Bay Coal Terminal, and that mutual cooperation agreement is going to be taken across Transnet. Uh, we've also worked closely through providing resources on operational excellence centers, which are in, in place now on, on the key corridors on the coal line, the, the ore line and, and uh, around DCT. Um, and I think more critically, um, we've, we've, uh, we've really engaged deeply um, as business. And, and these are milestones that, that you really can't have. So the milestone alone is the fact that Scully Carney was saying that we, we welcome the, the partnership Particularly right. on the uh, reform side, um, the freight logistics roadmap and the, um, the private sector participation framework, again, critical work and fundamental to what's needed, the draft network statement, um, the assenting by the president of the um, economic regulation of transport bill, which allows all of these things to happen. Um, and then more recently, the, uh, the partnering and the milestone uh, really dealing with the maintenance, with the independent technical assessments, which have been referenced or alluded to um, on the coal line and the ore line, where independent parties have assessed the condition of the track. I know we haven't done the so-called GFB section or the middle of the country, if you will, but we have got a good idea now, both ourselves and Transnet, um, around both the money, the timing, and, and the work packages that are required to restore both the coal line and the ore line to to their, their, maybe not their design capacity, but but close to it. And then very lastly, I, I think a real key in milestone in, in literally in the last month or so is, is there's a, a deep understanding now between business, um, the NLCC and the shareholder, uh, DOT, around what is required to drive economic growth in the country, what volumes are required uh, to be operated by um, or on the rail network, whether it's TFROC or whether it's uh, train operating companies, um, private train operating companies. And I think we've coalesced around a number of 250 million tons. Um, it's a long shot from where we are right now at, at kind of 160, 170, as Andrew was saying. But really the, the fact that we can now talk about numbers and, and that's what's needed to drive the economy and drive the growth and have a positive narrative. And that's really the thrust um, of uh, the partnership 2.0, which was launched a couple of weeks ago um, uh, with the president and the cabinet. And I think that in itself is a milestone that we've migrated now from 1.0 to 2.0. And uh, we have a number now, particularly as regards uh, transport. And then lastly, just to quickly touch on road, which really did, um, we've done some really great work on uh, together with the NLCC on uh, the N4 corridor. I think uh, people are seeing the benefits of big data being used on that corridor. There's a pulse report that comes out, which indicates the queue links, the um, the time at, at the border, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we want to take those learnings through to the other corridors as well. So we're trying to cross a number of, of the logistics modalities, but starting obviously with rail and with those five corridors and uh, also then dealing with road and the key road corridors as well. Thanks, yeah. sir. Thank you. Thanks, Alvin. Some some really great progress indeed uh, having been made uh, Thank the, you. the last uh, few years. Thanks for that uh, detail, uh, uh, Ian, much appreciated. Uh, Delhi Naidu had asked a question about um, what lessons can be learned from the progress that ESCOM has achieved. I think 
uh, you have indicated that certainly the lessons from the Energy Crisis Committee is being brought on board. Uh, Delhi, I hope you've answered. Um, uh, Daval Krishna has asked, do we have the skilled work uh, force to make, uh, to deal with all of the infrastructure that is required? Uh, probably to add to that in the, in the time frame that it is required to be put in place. Um, who would like to go for uh, that response? Okay, or Sia Bonga from, from BDO. Uh, Rudy, uh, maybe from broader work you guys have done. Yeah. So so let me start and and not that I have the solution, but my, I think that we need to adopt a mindset that says, does the country that is South Africa have the requisite skills that are necessary to um, undertake the work that needs to be done. So if that's the question, absolutely. Um, do we have that capacity in the right place? Probably not. And so I think we need to find ways of mobilizing the resources of the country from a, a, a skills and capacity point of view and make sure that it is channeled towards addressing our problems. If we think that any one sector for that matter, any one department can address the challenges it faces. We will fake. We have problems in water. And if we think that the people employed in the Department of Water and Sanitation are the only ones who are going to solve that, we will fake. So I think we need to adopt a mindset that says, do we have that capacity as a country? I think by and large we do, and we must find mechanisms of how we mobilize and utilize that capacity. There will be odd instances where that capacity doesn't exist, and we must get the capacity but not end there, we must build the capacity to sustain these changes over the long period of time so that it doesn't collapse as soon as, you know, those people that we bring in come, or, I mean, leave, leave, leave either those entities or leave the country for that matter. Thanks. Thanks, Johan. He, yeah. he has also commented that he does believe we have the skills in South Africa. Yeah. It may not be limited to public sector. Rudy? But perhaps, perhaps if it's okay, I mean, the question that was asked around learning from NECOM, we're applying that. I mean, we had more than 120 experts outside of um, ESCOM coming in and supporting supporting ESCOM. And, and that's the that's the value of getting the skills experts of those that have exited the system um, and exited ESCOM and are working in different parts of the private sector or consulting or having their own engineering firms that have been doing that. And I think that value of pulling on people that have that expertise and bringing them in and finding mechanisms for that to happen is there. So Kulakani is part on. We do have the experts. It's also useful to bring in some of the global people. I've said this, right? I mean, I uh, some of these things are new to us, right? So, so we've got to learn from what's happened in Germany. We've got to learn what's happened in Ethiopia or Kenya. We've got to learn what's happened in Italy. We've got to learn what's happened elsewhere in the world. And these are important learnings. I mean, we relate to the game. But with the learning curve, you are able to try and avoid some of the pitfalls and mistakes. And that's always a useful thing on bringing in international experts and that. And there's no shortage of them who are offering to be able to assist and advise us going forward. So I do think we have the right set of expertise. Fantastic, fantastic. There is a question from Belinda, and I know a lot of our discussion has revolved around the freight sector. Uh, but there is a question from Belinda Carlitz. Uh, uh, well, uh, all this uh, infrastructure as it's being upgraded, uh, fixed, improved, new infrastructure being put in place, uh, will it also cater for people with disabilities? Uh, and obviously, maybe more directly relating to passenger transport, but also in terms of using freight, uh, freight services and freight infrastructure. Um, you know, anybody maybe want to uh, take that uh, question. Um, thank you. The questions are coming. Um, uh, and it's good. We have a few more minutes. Who would like to take the question about catering to uh, people with disabilities in the yeah. transport system? Yeah, sorry. Um, thanks. Thanks, Alvin. Maybe I should I should cover cover that. I think I think it goes back to obviously what I said earlier on that 
uh, we, 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 in this discussion, we also need not neglect uh, the workforce. Um, I think in obviously catering for whatever form of transportation that's being implemented as, as currently we all know that billions and billions are being thrown into the problem to try and fix the issue of infrastructure. We obviously then need to cater for all of the needs, um, including uh, um, uh, people of this country um, that uh, um, are disabled and need to to be transported from point A to point B. So it's something that uh, truly needs to be put in mind as as we continue to develop. All right, thank you. Uh, I will be guided here by Shannon in terms of uh, going beyond 3 p.m. Taking one, two more questions, or um, are we going to have a hard stop, Shannon? No, no. Please continue. Continue. All right, great. Um, uh, uh, there's a few more uh, questions. Um, before we go into some of the specifics, I think there's one or two very operational questions. Uh, there is a question um, to Ian on, can we get insights on the N4 Pulse report? Maybe a bit uh, too operational, I think, for this discussion. Um, I think there was another question on um, uh, truck turnaround times in the port from uh, Naila Ibrahim. I think that's also a very, uh, very specific operational question. I, I don't think that uh, uh, Andrew might might um, be able to answer. Can we come back to the the funding issues? I think Nick Perret has posed a question on the debt position of Transnet currently. Uh, another, uh, well, he says 100 billion for infrastructure and equipment. Uh, we've heard uh, up to 220 billion uh, spoken about um, uh, the money is required, uh, 1 billion plus 1.2 billion for, on interest. Uh, I think next question is, is it really um, even realistic to expect some kind of um, uh, at, uh, the, the really dire situation that Transnet finds itself in? Andrew? Um, Alvin, thanks. I, I actually put my hand up just to quickly say on the skills issue that um, Transnet has an academy which which trains all the operational staff across our system. Now, obviously, as the system opens up to private operators, um, those training facilities become available to a broader subset of the economy. So uh, that's a key dimension of the skills the skills issue. We've we've been very self reliant from a skills perspective. You know, we haven't imported a lot of the operational skills as you. As you well know, um, the funding question is a very vexed question, and maybe it comes back to the the number that Jamie came up with, is the two twenty billion. I'm I'm guessing that that Jamie is infrastructure uh, plus rolling stock, um, because the rolling stock, if you add it to most of the projects that we look at look like uh, look at, is normally well over half of the overall project spend. Um, rolling stock is expensive, <clears throat> so the private sector would definitely have to bring its own uh, rolling stock into the system. Um, we are in the process, and there was a, a discussion before this about the PSP process. We are in the process of setting up a lease co, and we're going to be allocating substantial amounts of, of rolling stock into that, which which would also be available to the private sector, but essentially um, uh, on a lease basis. Um, so th that that is a big part of the funding question. Um, one of the reasons why we're doing the lease co, which let's say there's a twofold reason, one of them to enable uh, multiple operators, including ourselves, to get better quality roading stock, but also to help us pay down some of our debt. Um, as Nick rightly indicates, you know, our debt is is very substantial, somewhere in the region of 150 to 200 billion odd. Um, and we, we, we are burdened with that in terms of uh, repayments. In, if you look at our, our repayments against our operating costs, um, our repayments on debt are a substantial chunk of our, of our overall costs. And that's part of the reason why Transnet is struggling so significantly is it just can't facilitate these uh, debt repayments with the current revenue stream and volume stream. So that's what's led to this position. And, and a consequence of that is an underinvestment in the infrastructure. What we do see is that the opportunity to structure very carefully designed PSPs is a way to bring a cash back into the system and also drive up revenue in the system um, in such a way that we can help to pay that debt down. You now, at the moment, we move... We, we're, we're targeting 170 million tons for this year, but 
um, as Ian said, we would like to be moving 250 million tons. Now, if 250 million tons was moved tomorrow, all of those train operators, whoever they are, us and, and others, we'd all be playing a track access charge, which we very clear would quite quickly begin to repay um, investment in the network. Our contribution at 170 million tons is not sufficient to make sure that the network is properly rehabilitated. So, you know, this is a volume game and uh, economies of scale. Uh, economies of scale game. The more you can crowd in new operators onto the system, and it's just as equally true for ports as, as rail. The better you can actually um, repay the, the the debt for infrastructure. And linked to that funding question is the point that that Jamie made, where he talks about turnaround um, of of locomotives and wagons on the system. We see that every day. I mean, our turnarounds are probably 30 to 40 percent above what they should be. We call it cycle times. But what we do have is assets in the system that we're paying for that are actually only 60 percent efficient because they're just tied up to, uh, taking too long to get from pit to port or from industrial areas to ports. And so um, getting the system up and running and being more efficient and drawing in more funds is critical to actually getting this debt debt um, repaid. I think our challenge as a country is actually to get the system to operate um, at the maximum economies of scale so that we can compete with road freight. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Andrew. Um, I saw Jamie shaking his head a little bit. I think when you uh, said you, you believe he's um, 220 also includes rolling stock. Jamie, you want to maybe uh, clarify what uh, makes up that 220, 150 to 220? Yeah, um, Alvin, so to come to the estimation of 150 to 220 billion rand for the infrastructure, you know, if you take um, when the, so on, only on infrastructure in the work that Aria has done, yes, um, it's okay. you know, it's an estimation, our estimation as to what we thought needed to be spent on the container corridor at about 15 billion rand for 710 kilometers, and you extrapolate that over a network of 12,000 kilometers for the for the economically viable network, as we assume it, not the 23,000 kilometer network. If you extrapolate, extrapolate that over the network, you get to a number of about 250 billion, a number of about 250 billion for the infrastructure. If you use the assessments that have been done on so far on the on the on the container, I mean on the Northern Corridor and the coal and the iron ore line in terms of what needs to be spent on those, and you extrapolate those over the economically viable network of circa 12,000 kilometers, um, and I 100% agree with Andrew, the network needs to be rationalized out. I mean, there's, I mean that needs to happen yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you get to about 200 billion again. So, so, I mean, I think 150 is optimistic, to be honest, for infrastructure only. I think the numbers is a lot bigger. And I, and I think we need as a country to start wrapping our head around a much bigger number. Um, you know, the, the Minister of Finance has been, on, has been quite public about the fact that the that there's a policy and a strategy in place by the South African government to tap the South African private sector to invest into more trains and to invest into the uplifting of the condition of the infrastructure album. And that's what I was saying earlier. Let's mm -hmm. look at these PSB projects. Let's get stuck into the concessions and let's be big and be brave and do them quickly because the longer we sit on our hands and let the networks continue to degrade, the harder it is to get those projects to economic viability at all. We need to move fast. And, and all the time we, we don't do that it gets harder and harder to make it make sense in the end. The other thing I wanted to be completely clear about is that um, uh, is, is around that point. I don't believe it for a second that that private sector is saying that government fixed the infrastructure and we're going to bring trains. Not at all. I think that the private sector is look, going to invest in trains in the areas where it's economically viable. And as I've said, it's economically viable, in my view, in the bulk sectors. And two-thirds of the total volumes moved on the South African network today are bulk. So there's significant investments that I think are going to come in the short term into the bulk sectors, which is brilliant for the bulk sectors in South Africa. But unfortunately, that's when you're looking at the global perspective and the rail industry in South Africa and the whole and the economy as a whole, and the fact that there's another 85% of the network that doesn't move bulk, mm -hmm. we've got a bigger play here as a country. But is third-party access going to be successful? Are we going to see investment? Yes, we're going to see it soon, I believe, as soon as the network statement's confirmed. I do believe that the first investment cases will be announced next year. Certainly as traction we're intending to ourselves. Um, but my message is, like, let's get into these PSP projects. Let's, let's start looking at the concessions. Let's get the cycle times. Let's get huge investments into the track cycle times down and, and, and let's, you know, get competitive. I think there's definitely seems uh, room for further discussion on, on, on what the numbers should be. Uh, and how quickly it should come into the system. Uh, Rudy, there's a 
there's a bit of work there to bring the parties again together and let us have, wrap our heads around and around what is the quantum uh, required. Worry, worry, Lord Ian, I see your hand. I'm coming to you. Warwick Lord was um, also asking the question, uh, Jamie, to your point, uh, when is, is there some kind of a timeline given the processes with the network statement and everything else that must uh, uh, occur in the, in the interceding period? By when can we expect to see the first uh, uh, train operating company uh, running on the network? Is there some kind of a timeline for that? Um, anyone can take that, but uh, that's the question being posed. Uh, Ian, you wanted to come in, sir? Yeah, let me just quickly jump in on, on Jamie's point around the maintenance. Um, with the independent technical assessments having been done, in, and that was on both the coal and the ore line, were done in partnership between the private sector, the operators, like the, the exporters on those respective corridors and Transnet. Um, definitive um, work packages and, and costs were put there, though at a, at a fairly you know high medium to high level. Granted, um, it's being aligned. Both of them are being aligned at the moment with the detailed work that Transnet has in its own database of what's needed on those corridors. I generally don't think there's an, an issue around what needs to be done. I think there's an issue around the sequencing, and clearly there's an issue around the funding. With you know both of those circa you know in in the billions, north of ten billion each. Um, but the good thing is the, the new um, group chief operating office of Transnet is engaging um, the exporters on both of those corridors around exactly what can be done within the frameworks, as Andrew um, expressed earlier, um, that, that Transnet can, uh, the, the structuring and, and transaction structures that Transnet can, can manage at the moment. And how do we get going immediately? On, on at least those those two corridors with what is known at the moment and as I said aligning um, the sequencing and and both um, both uh, the assessments were over I think roughly a five year period um, including signaling overhead and and the track itself so they they comprehensive assessments and and uh, are being taken very seriously by Transnet and and the you know the private sector welcomes that approach from Transnet to see how it can deal with both the work. And the resources required to do the work to the earlier question, and more specifically now the funding, which is is the is the vexed question. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that uh, additional input there, Ian. Much appreciated as well. Um, Andrew, you also wanted to make a point on that, and then Rudy will come to you for perhaps an overview. There is another good question as well, which we haven't touched on from Tandi Healy, which I'd like to come back to which is looking a bit more on the road dimension of the system, which we haven't touched on at all. I'd really like to come back to that one. Andrew, to you, sir. Uh, uh, Elvin, I actually just put my hand up to you, um, answer the question, if possible, on uh, when we would allow a third party Yes, access. please. Yes, okay. please. So, so um, we're under a lot of pressure. Let's be, let's be fair. And some of the pressure comes directly from Rudy. Um, to get third party access onto the system <laughs> tomorrow. Um, but we're challenged by the fact that we need a pricing regime. We've set in place roughly the rules. We also need a network statement to be completely finalized. So what we've taken as a position that says, instead of trying to target a month or a day, is that we know that ARAC has got this vexed question, Jamie, um, about how much they're going to charge you and us for access to the network. And so they've got to come forward with a recommendation under the current agreed formulation of how the tariffs would be determined. And they've got to provide that to the Minister of Transport. The Minister of Transport in turn has to determine whether that recommendation should be implemented as is or whether there's adjustments, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't feel that it would be fair to allow anyone onto the network at a, with a pricing regime that we may decide now. And then that's all turned on its head in a few months time. So what we've said is, allow that process to conclude. Um, if, if I'm not mistaken, and I hope I'm right on this, Elvin, is that IREC is due to, by the end of this month, provide those recommendations to the minister. Mm -hmm. um, and we would um, we would provide open access to third party operators a month after the minister has taken a view on those um, IREC recommendations and provided her own recommendations. So I can't say exactly when that is, but I mean, it could be quite soon, um, which, which, which would be really, Really good. And then, Elvin, if I could just say on the previous question is, look, you can throw big numbers around. Just be careful with what you wish for. Um, one mm -hmm. of Jamie and our challenges is that we've got to compete with road freight, particularly on the mixed 
uh, freight, manufactured freight um, container market, if we spend too much on the network and we have this beautiful network, but we can't afford to operate any trains on it, you know, we're dead in the water. Um, and so some parts of the network may be better operated by just diesel trains, very si simple signaling, reasonable speeds. Um, and so actually getting to a reasonable cost to upgrade and getting that network in a reasonable condition is actually, the, for me, the bigger challenge than actually trying to throw around big numbers. So I'm kind of kind of, let's not focus too much on the numbers. If there happens to be a PSPs that address some parts of the network, um, I think some rationality will come to that because whoever comes in to help um, on that infrastructure will also have to determine how they're going to attract traffic onto the network. And then they'll say, okay, well, we can only spend X on the infrastructure if we're going to keep the pricing realistic. So I just wanted to bring that last last little piece in. Thanks. Uh, thank, thanks for that, Andrew. And I think it does bring us to this point that uh, Thandi has asked, and I'm going to ask the question exactly as she's uh, phrased it. And... Um, Rudy, then perhaps in your response, uh, just tying up this discussion around the quantum required and so on and where to start, um, to also then uh, please consider this question in, in your response. Yeah. Uh, do you think we will be able to achieve the migration of freight from road to rail without looking, obviously for the rail friendly traffic, without looking at balancing the investment on road and rail as uh, considering regulate in terms of considering regulation on road with respect to freight, and how are other countries managing this? And I think it, it does touch on that point. I'm, that I'm not, I'm, I'm not so familiar with how other countries are managing it, but you know the first point that we've got to do is get bulk commodities that are not supposed to be on the road onto rail. Mm -hmm. You know, so we can't have manganese, you can't have or you can't have coal, chrome, magnetite on the road. Um, the road was never designed for that, right? And so our precious investments that we spend continuously in maintaining our excellent road network mm -hmm. is being destroyed on the N4, is being destroyed on the N7. So we've got to, we got to get that. But I, I do what I mean, J Jamie's point is important, and I've raised this with the colleagues in the way that you've got to discuss about what you do with the core network, right? So, so of course, I mean, easily said, that if you do allow for private sector participation and you say it is for the bulk lines, you're going to get flurry of people that are kind of coming. But we've got to, we I said, I've got to think about the broad economy. So what 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 happens in the instance when we've got to talk about palletized goods, uh, autos, uh, general freight, you know, mm -hmm. uh, forestry, for example, and stuff like that. And we've got to think through different approaches and methodology, including pricing methodologies of how we incentivize in those instances where they're also not bulk, but they're quite important to get on rail from a cost and efficiency point of view, mm -hmm. right? So that our road network is not destroyed, quite important. So again, it's about the design, it's about how we think through the role of uh, various private sector participants, participants. At the end of the day, I mean, I think uh, um, Alvin, it's about whether these projects can be bankable and feasible for the private sector, you know. And the NATCO is one good example of this. You know, we got to mm. we got to think about you know opportunities out there. Oh, 48 potential slots that are available over there. You know, can it be better run from a private sector point of view if we incentivize it sufficiently enough for the NATCO to be run in a manner that I think could you know reduce the volumes. But um, Tani's point is spot on because there are economic consequences of choices, right? I mean, of course, the economic efficiency and from a externality point of view, it's important to get these products onto the rail network because it's part of our commitments towards climate um, um, and green and, and, and green the economy, right? Um, you know, rail is more efficient and more climate climate friendly. Mm. If we don't burn diesel, we've got the electricity working. I've got to make that point, right? So in the instances where we do require diesel, let's minimize it um, um, and, and ensure that we... We better connect or invest in new forms of technology. Um, you know, in running our uh, running our locomotives. This is currently being done in some of the projects that's there. But the economic consequences is that there's thousands and thousands of trucks, hundreds of thousands of trucks on the road that employ drivers, and we got to think about that. You know, that as a as a as a consequence. So it, it has to take you know considerations as to what happens in the broader logistics sector, and whether the kind of choices that we make has either negative aggregate change or positive aggregate change. We've been running some of the models and we think if we get more freight onto rail, 
there is a general um, positive aggregate, um, um, you know, impact that's there. But certainly, I think, as you know, I mean, um, you know, truck drivers and and the companies are going to are going to have to be talked, spoken to, and we've got to manage that process in a in a in a better in a better way. Or potentially, we may have very angry, um, you know, workers who have lost their jobs um, that should be in Georgia and, uh, uh, should be absorbed in other parts of the of the freight of the freight sector. So I thought I'll make that point. And uh, Andrew, sorry, my, my point of what Andrew was saying was precisely that. I want to just pinpoint Andrew. I know, I know, you know, you you. It's easier for me to say the talk, the, the dates because I think it's quite critical that we've, we've, we've got to work through on getting it and signaling the network statement with the access charge and price out there. It's very difficult in an environment where you don't have a, a, a full-time established regulator, although, I mean, the act has been passed by the president and we've got to put it into motion. But the fact of the matter is that you don't want Jamie suddenly to think through and say, but this is this is not feasible. You know, this is not going to help me. I can't bank on a proposal with an access charge or with the rules around a network statement in that manner. So we've got to work through it systematically. And I know the team behind the scenes have been working really, really hard and getting the right technical expertise to get that right. And of course, working through the system of approval through the minister, getting it to transnet to approve it, and then getting it out into the market. So certainly. Um, we're looking forward to ensuring that that potentially happens um, later in this year or early next year. And I think it's just a question of time, but quite exciting. And I think Jamie as a private sector operator, if he positively says he knows it's going to happen so we want to keep to those type time frames. But there are technical requirements that we've got to go through, unfortunately, and consultations to be able to get it right. If we don't get that initial methodology right, we may have a disservice either for private TOCs that come on or for Andrew having to then balance the books. And we don't want it necessarily where Andrew comes and says, can the fiscus bail us out because we made a wrong choice around how we needed to model the access price. Or Jamie basically saying, sorry, I can't do this. And it mm -hmm. flops in the way that we haven't gotten an agreed kind of uh, you know, access charge with the, with the details of a network statement going forward. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Roger. I think those those touch on some of those critical success factors. I think that I mentioned uh, earlier on in the discussion that uh, we do need to make sure that the right ducks are in the row, uh, so that we don't find ourselves getting out of the station and having to constantly come back again, come back again. I does touch on that. Um, uh, there's a couple of more questions in Jabalo and Jabalo uh, Mataba. Sorry, sir. Uh, I know you've had your question up for a while. Uh, given all that's happening in the transport and logistics system and all the deterioration, uh, your question: Will studying logistics or supply chain management be fruitful in the near future? Uh, uh, being uh, with the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, uh, where we involved with uh, education and training of professionals in the industry, um, as there's never a bad time to study transport and logistics. Whether it's for today, and especially when there's problems in the system, <laughs> it's a really good time to get in there. Uh, but the nice thing about uh, transport and logistics is that. Um, uh, a, a lot of what we do is uh, is uh, you know works with international rules and fits with international protocols, and so studying and getting qualified in something here is uh, is a very transportable uh, excuse the pun skill that you can take with you anywhere around the continent or the country. So please go ahead and and study. I'm not even going to ask the panel to <laughs> to give their input on this, but I'm sure in the next few years, Andrew or Jamie or whoever, as they are executing these plans, they would need to employ uh, properly uh, skilled people. Um, so please uh, go ahead and do that. Barbarossa Nchingila, uh, my good friend, uh, nice to hear from you again, ex-colleague at TFR. He's posing a specific question to Dr. Shaw on theft and vandalism. Uh, essentially, he's asking the question, how is Transnet, uh, perhaps by extension government, going to deal with the um, theft and vandalism issues so that when private sector gets uh, the, the, um, uh, the uh, slots or the arrangements to operate the trains, that that does not, not become a, a setback or a burden to the train operating companies. Uh, 
Um, but it's a very, it's a very good question. Um, maybe just to say, at the moment, what we are doing around the theft and vandalism issue is we have outcomes-based security contracts. So um, in the past, we would in, not incentivize the security companies that we employ to protect the line infrastructure. We, they would really just be warm bodies. So <clears throat> we would count up how many security personnel there were um, and uh, what kind of reaction uh, equipment, et cetera, they have. Um, whereas now on the basis of outcome-based security, um, the focus is actually on reducing the crime rates um, and also seeking to um, uh, to to cap capture some of the those involved in the crime. And so there's certain incentives that are placed on 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 security, including some intelligence-based incentives um, for with local communities, et cetera. And that seems to be working. So that's the one mechanism. The second one is through NLCC, and, and I'll ask Rudy if he wants to just add to this, but um, there's been a much closer alliance with um, the justice and policing community. And what we've seen, uh, I looked just before this call just to see the stats, is in the last three weeks um, prior to today, um, and compared to the last three weeks of the same time last year, we've had a 30% reduction in, in security incidents. Unfortunately, it's not always sustainable. It seems to follow sort of weird patterns. And also, as you become more successful in one part of the network, it sort of springs, springs up in... In, in other parts of the network. Um, then if I could, um, Alvin, if I could just say in the, in the previous discussion on road versus rail, you know, our own statistics in Transnet show that if we actually had the infrastructure and the operations in place on the bulk side, we'd move another 50 to 60 million tons on rail at that rail price. So it would just come to us. A lot of that, not all of it, is already on road. So, so getting that bulk, as Rudy says, off road and onto rail is critical. So if we could pick up that 50 to 60 million tons, would boost the economy um, and would also move a lot of freight off rail. And then a second point that relates to Jamie's point around that core is I picked up the Helco study, which you would remember from your old days in Transnet, which is about 1990. And actually in that study, in about the early 90s, there were more trains moving on the NATCO or the container corridor than they were moving on any of the bulk corridors. So it just gives you a sense of the opportunity for general freight. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks for that, uh, Andrew. I'm gonna leave the uh, panel with a with a with a challenge, in as much as there's a lot of activity now. Uh, unfortunately, we know TFR has fallen to around 150 million tons, target 171 or 72. Um, we've come from a recent high eight nine years back on 227. Um, and I think a lot of the energy and what we're trying to do now is, is to just get back to somewhere around 230, 250. I do want to leave the challenge to the panel and the planners and the thinkers and the strategists on, on this improving the system. Uh, that we really do start quite quickly uh, shifting focus to thinking about how do we get 350, 400 million tons on rail in short order. I think they our statistics and information that says that is what is about available uh, for rail and certainly the opportunity for private uh, uh, train operators uh, in combination with TFOC. Um, I think I think we need to shift uh, uh, our vision a little bit uh, to beyond the immediate and, and look at the long term and prepare and organize ourselves uh, to achieve that. But wonderful to hear all the progress that's been made, all the efforts that's been made, and uh, a, a tangible sense that we that we are quite close to something happening. And once it happens, uh, we basically learn from there and and make progress. I'm hoping that uh, we we're not going to have too many setbacks. Um, I think we're just about on time. I'm gonna then just give it over to uh, the panel members. A quick a uh, few uh, 30 seconds of of, uh, of a feedback from your side to close out. And then Rudy, I started with you, but I would like to, you know, pay due respects to, to the office of the presidency and leave it with you to, to round it off for us as we end. And then we can hand over to uh, to Shannon after that to just close out the session. Uh, Sia Bonga, can I start with you, good sir? 30 seconds. 
Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Elvin. I think uh, a very, very good conversation. And uh, it's great to see that there is actually progress being made. Uh, however, I think uh, the, the most important and key thing is obviously the, the private-public partnership. I think it's going to help in terms of the investment that's needed, as well as the skills um, issue that we were talking about. So thank you. Ian? Yeah, <clears throat> business fully supportive of exactly where we're going and, and the good work done by Will and Lela and still to be done both in the uh, stabilization and improvement of, of all the, the value chains, including road, as well as then looking forward into the structural reform. We remain committed and invested and we're here for the long haul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie? Um, I think we've come an enormously long way in a short period of time. I'm, I'm one of the people that don't feel that rail reform is happening slowly. I, I think rail reform is happening at the appropriate speed. Um, as, as both Andrew and Rudy have said, if you get it wrong um, and we don't invest, that's catastrophic because investment is, is the biggest barometer of success for rail reform. Um, I do think at this moment that's very important and extremely honest with ourselves about what we need to tackle in terms of the number of money, the amount of money we need to spend in the infrastructure. But, but no, I think. Thank you. Moving forward, the CEOs of very large corporations signed the pledge to partner with government in resolving some of these critical challenges facing us. And that just shows how committed um, and loyal the business community is to solving this challenge. I do sincerely believe that if we work together, we will uh, overcome these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, thank you very much, um, Alvin, also for hosting this session. I think um, the one message that we want to come across as Transit is we're very committed to the reform process. It doesn't always look like it, but you must realize the size of the organization that we have to retransform into its various component parts. We, what the balancing act for us going forward is to get the recovery and the stabilization right. So we're working closely with customers and we can't stop that. We've got to keep on, even if it's only slowly, drive the uh, performance across the existing system, but also then accelerate the PSP process. And there's a lot of pressure for us to do that, particularly from our new shareholder. Thanks, thanks, uh, Andrew. Mr. Dix, we'll give you one minute, sir. <laughs> no, no, you give me 30 Double seconds. Time. Don't discriminate. Uh, Kolakan is going <laughs> to moan after the meeting and say, why are you discriminating? <laughs> 30 seconds. But nonetheless, I, I look, I'm, I'm really excited. I, I'm always having people like this on the panel, people like Jamie, for example, who are skin in the game, Ian and them, Andrew, of course, and Kolakan and them, having that, that political economy leadership is going to be quite critical. So I'm really excited. Jamie's right. I think we're moving pretty fast. Sometimes I think a little bit too fast, Jamie. We've got to get the market to move with us, including the financing. Yes, I'm not behind the curve. But I think I think the kind of signals that we signal are the right ones and uh, important for us. Keep track. Hold us accountable. Um, make sure that we are transparent and that everybody has an opportunity to be part of the kind of growth and boom. That's the ultimately from where I sit, Alvin, it's about, um, you know, what can we do for South Africa and get the economy growing, which is the, which is ultimately employment and investment, right? And that's going to be quite critical. The one thing that I think we we, we never do enough is to thank the hardworking people of Transnet, led by Michelle, led by the new um, chief operating officer, Solly, and people like Andrew and the rest of the teams that are there. Difficult circumstances, they've been able to stabilize. We've got to build on that and then hopefully see a little bit of an upswing in getting those volumes and getting the operational performance. So, um, you know, it's, I'm sorry, um, congratulations. And I think, um, you know, absolutely um, wonderful job that the teams have been doing. We've got to do a lot more and we're there to support you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew uh, and uh, Rudy, uh, Jamie, everybody on the panel, Ian Kulikani, Isia Bonga. Uh, there are still a few more questions, but uh, we're not going to get to those. I, I really do think that we've we've done quite well uh, in covering a lot of ground in, in the conversation today. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much to the panel members for all your contributions and sharing with us um, uh, everything that you have shared with us. It's exciting. Uh, hopefully, uh, if we, when we have this session next year and whether or not I'll be facilitating next year or not, I'm not sure. But hopefully, Shannon, when we have this section, session next year, we will be talking about uh, the first few 
uh, train operators that's on board and how well that's going. Uh, back to you, Shannon. Thanks, Alvin. Yes, I hope you are telling um, the future. <laughs> we'll see <you> next year. <laughs> that brings us to the end of the discussion. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to Elvin Harris for enabling an engaging discussion. Thank you also to our panelists, Rudy Dix from the Private Office of the President, Sia Bonga Mtembu from BDO South Africa, Jamie Holly from Traction and the Africa Railway Industry Association, Kulikani Mate from Business Unity South Africa, Ian Bird from Business for South Africa, and Dr. Andrew Shaw from Transnet SOC for their insights. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Astron Energy, BDO South Africa, MTN and Investec for their support in making this webinar possible. And finally, we thank the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on South Africa's transport sector. We hope you found this event engaging and informative. We really appreciate your participation and thank you for all the questions that you sent through. Our next webinar takes place on the 20th of November at 2 p.m. It's in partnership with investing in African mining in Darba and will focus on unlocking Africa's critical minerals. The link to register for that event has been shared in the chat. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you all in due course. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. Thank you so much for your time and goodbye.